Hallelujah. You can turn with me in your Bibles over to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. We started talking on Sunday on uh, the subject of reaching out to the lost, preaching the gospel. God's call upon our lives to be salt and light to be his ambassadors, to herald the glad tidings. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that's uh, who we are, and every one of us has been so commissioned to go. Amen? Have you um, uh, taken some time to meditate on and memorize the scriptures that were assigned there on Sunday? Who's got one this evening? Who'd like to share one? Uh, i got a bunch of hands going up over here. We'll start with Aaron and work our way forward. It was very real in the hearts of the apostles. They had been with Jesus. They had seen his works. They had heard his teachings. They had seen him rise from the dead. Seen him after the resurrection. Amen? Amen. And they couldn't help but testify. Do you have a testimony? Do you have a testimony of having been dead and now you're alive? You were blind now you see. Do you have an assurance that your sins have been forgiven? Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead, triumphant over sin, on your behalf? See, when those truths are real and big in our hearts, we can't keep silent, can we? We can tell somebody. We're not going to hide that under a bushel, are we? No. And by the grace of God, and with the anointing of his Holy Spirit, we'll be shouting it from the housetops. Abigail, which one did you want to share? Uh, Matthew 9.36. Great. Matthew 9, Great, thanks. And Catherine? Matthew 9.36. We can, thank you. We can, we can only imagine the heart of the Lord for lost humanity. God's design from the beginning was that he'd make man in his image after his likeness. Adam was called the son of God. Amen? And fallen humanity down through the ages, rejects and denies and reaps the consequences of their rebellion. But God, who is love, longs to see souls saved, doesn't he? So much so that he spared not his own son. He, yep, he, he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, didn't he? He did. And Jesus, uh, moving among the people, just sees them. Not that he was unaware before he came in, in a human form, but he looks on the multitudes. He comes with a message of hope and uh, restoration of relationship, of forgiveness and newness of life. And people so bound in their sin, in their rebellion, continue in their, their, their evil ways, their self-destructive ways, and Jesus is moved with compassion, isn't he? Well, you got folks like that in your family and on your job and where you live that are bound in their sin, dead. They're in bondage to the devil. They're, <clears throat> they're, they're held captive and taken captive by him at his will. And the only thing that can set them free is Jesus. The only... One who can set them free is Jesus. And the only message that can set them free is the message of the gospel. Amen? Do we look on the multitudes with compassion? Uh, I think in part why we're on the subject is uh, just a concern that we ever be on guard against getting caught up with life on this earth. It's a constant danger. Oh, I don't mean you just got to give your, yourself wholly over to uh, uh, lustful, just consuming your, you know, your, all your time and energies on, on, uh, on your career or, or your, uh, your possessions. Just entangled, caught up, and forgetting that, yeah, Jesus is coming back soon. The days are short. 
The nighttime's coming when no man can work. And while we are at liberty to, to walk in the peace and enjoy God's peace and his goodness to us, we enjoy the, the, the material blessings that he has provided. We're at liberty to enjoy the, the wonderful relationships that he's given to us in, in family and friends. But we cannot allow ourselves to get distracted from his call upon our lives. Amen? And it's, an, <clears throat> it's a constant danger. And only by his grace can we stay vigilant and stay sober and keep ourselves stirred up and be able to look on people that we don't even know with compassion. Be concerned and caring about their lost state. Only by God's grace. And if that's not real in our hearts, that is a compassion for souls, then ask God to, to make it real. Because it's real in his heart. It's real to him. All you got to do is start asking him. Guaranteed, he'll stir that and strengthen it. Maybe there's some there already. You ask him, he'll strengthen it in your heart. A love for the lost. Seek him on it. Pray and, and uh, see if you, if you don't observe that you're more concerned than you've ever been before for the condition of lost souls. Amen? Well, on Sunday we talked about <clears throat> having been commissioned. We talked about compassion. We talked about uh, being compelled. Yep, the, can't help but speak the things which we've seen and heard. Amen? And then we finished up talking about being, being ashamed. And there are a couple of passages that I wanted us to visit briefly uh, on that subject before we moved from not being ashamed of the gospel, not being ashamed of that worthy name by which we've been called. Here in 1 Peter, <clears throat> chapter 4, verse 16, the scripture says, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this behalf. If you suffer as a Christian, you know, you're rejected, you're misunderstood, you're, you're ridiculed, you're no longer quite so welcome among family and friends as you used to be. There's that kind of suffering, and there, it gets worse than that, doesn't it? But you don't have to be ashamed, on the contrary. On the contrary, rejoice and be exceeding glad, says the scripture. Amen? Don't be ashamed. Don't, you know, you've, you've not done something wrong. Nothing to be embarrassed about that you don't fit in. You fit into the body of Christ. You're accepted in the beloved. And that's what counts. Amen? Yeah. You don't have to be embarrassed or feel awkward. You do stand out. You shine forth like that city set on a hill. Amen? That's who you are. And the Bible tells us that we live in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation, a dark generation. And we shine forth as lights. Amen? And to, the, to those that are in darkness, sometimes, yes, the light is an offense. And they don't like you around. And they can be nasty about uh, not liking you around. And you don't need to be ashamed, he says. If you suffer as a Christian. In Mark chapter 8, Mark chapter 8, <clears throat> is a good uh, warning, sober reminder, where in verse 38, Jesus says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also Shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels? He confess him before men, he'll confess you before the Father which is in heaven. You deny him before men, he will deny you before the Father in heaven. We're not ashamed, amen? No. We stand up and proudly proclaim that we're Christians. And we're not embarrassed to say that we are not of this world, that our home is in heaven. We're not embarrassed to say those kinds of things, that we believe in an unseen God. And we, we pledge our allegiance to his heavenly kingdom. And we're looking for his soon return. We're not 
embarrassed or ashamed to proclaim those things, are we? And sure, there will be those who will mock and they'll, <clears throat> they'll say that you're a kook to believe in the unseen. Uh, the, 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 the naturalist, the scientist, uh, the one who, who looks at the world and sees that it's all physical, it's all natural, who denies the existence of the realm of the spirit. And obviously in this world system, those individuals are held in esteem and those are considered to be the people who really know, aren't they? And the people who believe in God are well, they're labeled as religious kooks or simpletons. Simple. You're just simple. Just dumb as a rock to believe in God. Well, that's the way the world looks at you. And you can look right back at the world and tell them that Jesus loves them anyways and is ready to forgive them if they'll repent of their rebellion and hard-heartedness. Amen? Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of that worthy name. Well, right along those lines, we want to talk about not being afraid of men's faces. Let's turn together over to Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29. How full the scripture is of, of instruction and warning and encouragement, admonition and exhortation. Here in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25 says that the fear of man bringeth a snare. The fear of man bringeth a snare. In what way? As it would pertain to the gospel, sharing the gospel. Well, if we're afraid of what men can do to us, we're afraid of how they'll uh, perceive us. We've, you know, we, we took some time again on Sunday, talked about how as social beings, we like being accepted, fitting in, being a part. And uh, a Christian doesn't fit in to this world's system. We're in this world, but not of it. Amen. And if we're afraid of what people could do, what they'll say, how we'll be perceived, or uh, what, you know, what harm they might do to us, or how they might uh, you know, put us out of their circles, then we're snared. We're, we're not good for the, the light. It's, that's like putting, it, putting the light under the bushel, isn't it? It's hiding the light. If we allow fear to control and dominate, then we're not good for being the, the witnesses and the ambassadors, the salt and the light that we've ordained, been, been ordained to be, been called of God to be. We're snared, we're caught, we're trapped. More concerned about men's faces and what they might do to us, what they might say about us, what the consequences might be. And, you know, it's not just being mocked and ridiculed. Some people lose their jobs. People lose their reputations. People lose their lives, don't they? People lose their families, don't they? Yeah. But a Christian is willing to suffer any loss for their Lord. Amen? Amen. And we're not afraid. Not afraid. We know. And thankfully, the scripture, the Lord, warns us, lets us know in advance that these things do happen to Christians. They've happened in Bible times, and they've happened since the last words of this book were penned. Persecution. The history book of the New Testament, the book of Acts, shows us right out of the, right out of the gate. The church is being persecuted, isn't it? Followers of Jesus Christ. Jesus rose triumphant over the grave, over death, over hell, over the devil. And the devil didn't take it lying down, did he? No, going to do whatever he can do to snuff this thing on out. And you're not afraid. You're not afraid of the devil. And you're not afraid what man can do, the face of man. And they'll look you in the eye and they'll threaten you. And yeah, they have some power and authority here on earth. 
but not in the realm of the heavens. Amen? They can't do any harm to your soul. So you're not afraid of them. Because the part of you that lasts forever is untouched by any attack that they can bring against you. So just like water off a duck's back. Or a little angel's back, maybe. <clears throat> Look at me over to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Jesus is quite pointed here, isn't he? He says, verse 27, verse 28, What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the air, that preach ye upon the housetops. And that's just the Lord. He's, he's putting it on your heart, isn't he? Sure he is. He's just telling you that, yep, I'm your, I'm your God. And he's making real to you that Jesus is the only Savior. Amen? He's, he's making that real to you in your heart by his spirit. And that you, yep, you proclaim in the highways and in the hedges, shouting it from the housetops. You tell people. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So you don't need to be afraid of the one that can only kill your body. And we should, we should at least be mentally prepared for that. I don't know that that, that end, that fate will come to any of us. It might come to all of us. There have been plenty of good brothers and sisters through the ages that have paid the ultimate price of their life because of their love for the Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. And we're not exempt just because it's the 21st century and we live in America and we've got a constitution and no, nope, we're not exempt. No. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of them. And, you know, if you hear of, of brothers and sisters, you know, uh, you might read literature where you read accounts of good Christian people suffering horrifically in modern times. And you don't need to be afraid, do you? Is the Lord there with his people to keep them and protect them and pre preserve them? Mm -hmm. Better believe he is. That's their testimony. If they, if they live through it, their testimony is that God keeps them, was there with them to sustain them. Amen? Amen. You don't need to be afraid of those that can kill the body. So if we take, if we take our, uh, the, the possible concerns out to the extreme, I mean, that would be fair. That death would be the extreme, right? Right? So then back it off of that. How bad can it get? Uh, torture, maybe I know some might argue that uh, torture is worse than death. Well, yeah, you know, <clears throat> prolonged pain, sorrow, suffering, sure, prob probably an argument there. But the, the point, of course, is that if the, uh, the worst that, the, the, that man can do is kill you, you don't need to be afraid. Don't need to be concerned because God is there keeping you in his care by his power and, and will do so. Amen? Amen? So you're going to preach the gospel, but you've got some reservations. What's the nature of the reservations? What's the, what's the concern? Okay? Well, okay, there you, there you got it. Right? There's nothing that you can come up with that would uh, be a legitimate reason for not sharing. Right? Yeah. There's no good reason. Nothing that could be done to you that would be, uh, that would prohibit you from sharing the gospel. So there's nothing there, is there? No. The worst they can do is kill you. <clears throat> and God says, don't be afraid if, they, if that's all they can do then, yeah, you're on safe ground. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 1. Mm. 
you might say that the passage we just read um, uh, comes to us sort of as, a, as an encouragement. And I know you think, well, don't be afraid of getting killed. It's a word of encouragement. Uh, <clears throat> it doesn't really come across as the, as the stern warning, though. It really comes across as, as a reminder that it, it can only get so bad. You with me there? But here in Jeremiah, it comes more uh, across as a, uh, that, uh, that, that warning, that, that stern uh, <clears throat> uh, admonition, don't fear. From verse 4, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. So here he, um, he the Lord responds to Jeremiah's uh, excuse uh, the reason that he renders for not being able he says I, I can't do that but the Lord really puts his finger on the, the real issue it's not just that I'm a child he says don't you be afraid and he it, it really is an admonition isn't it hear it that way do not be afraid fear not not just uh, uh, you can do this and, and, and those guys, uh, they might be nasty, but, you know, they, they can't hurt you that badly. No, let it, let it be heard by us in spirit from God as an admonition, uh, uh, a reminder. Nope, being afraid is not allowed. Like, thou shalt not be afraid. Good there? Because uh, we can choose to give place to the fear, or we can choose not to, can't we? We can, we can choose to uh, give in to the fear and allow it to dominate, or we can choose to draw on the grace of God and say, no, uh, I, I am aware of this uh, fear. Um, I'm concerned about what might happen, how I might be perceived, uh, what they'll say. But God told me not to be afraid, so I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to do what I was told to do. If he tells me to speak, which he does, I will speak. Hear it that way. The Lord put forth his hand, touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth, and he will do that. Open up your mouth and he'll fill it. Who hasn't uh, known the experience of being a little bit intimidated uh, by, uh, by redirecting a conversation? It wasn't necessary, necessarily the person themselves, but it was just, you know, bringing the conversation around, uh, sharing the gospel with somebody. Felt a little bit uneasy, but man, as soon as you broke the ice, you were off and running. Isn't that the way it goes? Yep, you just, okay, here I go, and you just jump on in. Say, can I talk with you a minute about your soul? Are you familiar with the gospel of Jesus Christ? And, and, and you're going, aren't you? You stepped out in faith and the Lord puts his word in your mouth, doesn't he? Don't allow that concern, that little bit of reservation, that oh, I just feel a little bit intimidated by the circumstances. Don't allow that to control. And that's an order. <laughs> Hear it that way. Hear it that way. That's what the Lord's saying to Jeremiah. Don't be afraid. Not, not allowed. Well, uh, well, we'll shift gears just a little bit and talk on another happy subject of persecution and rejection. Good there? <clears throat> Go with me over to Psalm 109. Psalm 109. We, we touch on some interesting subjects when we talk about uh, sharing the gospel and being salt and light. And these, these passages of Scripture are here for our encouragement, and they're for our instruction, and they're for our help. I wanted to start here because this is the master, and, and, uh, and if they hated him, we should not expect that we're going to have it 
any better than he did. Amen? Amen. Psalm 109, verse 4 and verse 5 read, For my love, they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. And they have rewarded me evil for good and hated and hatred for my love. Well, why was Jesus so hated? Because he spoke the truth to people. If he had not spoken, then they wouldn't have hated him. But he brought a message to them in love that would save their souls if they were willing to hear. Amen? And because he loved them, they hated him. When a soul, a, a, a Christian, shares the gospel, like we talked of, yeah, we're, do, we're doing so out of a love for our Lord and out of a love for fellow human beings. We're, we're not interested and we're not willing. We don't desire to see any soul go to hell. And so out of love and, and submission to the Lord Jesus, we tell people about their need to repent and believe the gospel. And love motivates that witness, doesn't it? And the rejection and the persecution is a response to the love that you have shown. You offered somebody the life preserver and they cursed you for it. Get rid of that stupid thing. I don't need your help. And maybe they don't use quite those words, but you know, this thanks, but no thanks. And there's rejection, isn't there? Because you've loved them. Because you've shared truth with them. And now they're feeling a little awkward and they want to change the subject and, and uh, you persist and they want you gone or they wish you to take your Jesus and go you know where and for, for love. Look at me over to Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Don't you love the Beatitudes? Hallelujah. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. We think of these blessings that are upon the people of God. Amen? Well, we'll drop down to verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Well, we, um, <clears throat> we, uh, we like to think of, of blessings coming in other forms, don't we? Yeah. But here, blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He says, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So get, get geared up in your mind and in your heart. Amen? When the light is shining, shining opposition, persecution, rejection come count yourself to be blessed you're in good company that's what he says here so persecuted they the prophets which were before you blessed because you're just letting your light shine you're, you're not ashamed of Jesus you're showing yourself to be a true worker together with him amen you're willing to suffer rejection and persecution. You're willing to be misunderstood and despised and rejected. You're, you're willing to experience that out of love for your Lord and out of a desire to see this soul for whom Jesus died, see them saved. Amen? Amen. And God says you're blessed. You're blessed. To be able to take on that, that perspective. You're walking with the Lord. That's, that's, that's fellowshipping with Jesus, isn't it? That's being a worker together with him, isn't it? I mean, where are we going to fellowship with Jesus? You can't do all your fellowshipping with Jesus in the prayer closet or services like this where we lift our hands and praise God together and sing, sing our, our, our love and, and, and adoration for him. That's not the only way you get blessed. Can't do that exclusively. You got to get out there in the highways and the hedges. Amen? 
and know the fellowship of being a worker together with him. That, uh, that uh, where, him, where he is, there his servant is also, he says. Amen? Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You're the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its, his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It's thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out, trodden underfoot of men. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So there's... <clears throat> There's some persecution and rejection that comes, but let the light shine brightly. Go over to John 15. John 15. John 15. He says, verse 20 and following. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. And <clears throat> that's where you really find out where people stand. You with me there? See, those that are of God hear God's word. We got a lot of religious people in this world. We got a lot of people who name the name of Jesus. I mean, we live in Western culture. All kinds of folks claim Christianity. But when you let the light shine, you stand up for truth, the truth of the gospel. Uh, if you got people that are just playing religion, they'll hate you they'll end up being offended at you because of the light. For my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. They don't know truth. If the light is shining, children of the light love the light, don't they? But if the light is sh shining in the darkness, the children of darkness are offended at the light. And they hate the light. And they'll hate you because the light is shining forth from you. All these things will they do unto you for my name's sake because they know not him that sent me. So don't think it's strange. Don't think it's strange. Doesn't mean you're doing something wrong when you're standing as a Christian. And you're standing on the truth. And you get people upset at you. And people are angry at you. And you're, you're just sharing truth with them. You're living the truth. You're walking it on out. You're challenging them. Because yes, uh, this preaching of the gospel goes on out to not only the, 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 the people who plainly declare to be uh, godless, there's a lot of preaching of the gospel that needs to go on to those who name the name of Jesus, but aren't walking according to his, his will, according to his word. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, he says, and don't do the things that I tell you to do? So just because somebody says they're a Christian, I mean, you got, uh, <clears throat> we're thankful that the Lord has left for us the example that he has left us, uh, the ministry that Jesus brought and the early disciples brought was most directed toward the people that knew the most about the living and true God. They are the ones that insisted on Jesus' death and were bent on destroying Jesus' followers. The people who had the law and the prophets. And there are a lot of religious people that hate you. Uh, because they have not known the one who sent Jesus. Amen? And right in that same vein, you can go with me over to Matthew 24. Matthew 
I guess you have this in just a pep talk to get on out and pass, it, pass out a few uh, gospel tracts. Though, passing out gospel tracts is a good thing to do. This is a really easy time of year to do it, too. You know, with, uh, not that there isn't always, it, it, it isn't always easy. But grab some, some of these Christmas gospel tracts. Are they out yet? Are they out yet? Oh, okay. They will be before the end of the evening, won't they? Yes. I know the kids are putting a bunch of labels on over the weekend there. And we can get them out on the tables there and grab some. Tell people about the reason for the season. Amen? Yeah, talk with them. It's really easy. You know, hey, do you celebrate Christmas? Uh, you know what, that Christmas is really about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Savior of the world? Can I give you something to read? Really easy thing to do, isn't it? Yeah, wherever you go, out and about, <clears throat> where you work, where you shop, <clears throat> well, unless you're doing all your shopping online. <laughs> Matthew 24. <clears throat> then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. False prophets shall arise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. So, uh, being delivered up to be afflicted, killed, hated of all nations. People offended, people betraying one another. <clears throat> Shift gears with me and go with me over to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Oh, what's that about? Don't like the timing on that one. Thanks. Just one at a time there, guys. It's a girl thing. I have to teach those boys that. The gospel is powerful. Profoundly powerful. Powerful, powerful, powerful. And that's what's spoken of there in Romans chapter 1. We talked of the first part of this verse, 16, didn't we? Where I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God into salvation. Truth is, is incredibly powerful. Remember that. So as we shift gears from persecution and rejection, okay, let's talk about how powerful the word of God is. Remember that the word is alive. It's spirit. The, the Jesus and his word are one. God takes truth and he, by his spirit, works into a, a person's heart, past the, the mind, past the intellect, past the reason, into the realm of the heart, into the realm of the spirit. And the light shines and, and brings conviction, brings illumination, doesn't it? So you're not just, oh, how, how often we say it, you're not just sharing a personal philosophy, are you? Nope, you're speaking living truth, living truth. Remember that it is by the word of God that the very world in which the universe uh, that we know, a physical universe, was brought into its existence through the word of God. And the word that you speak is alive and powerful. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. You share gospel truth with somebody and it has the power of bringing about sufficient illumination and conviction, a su su sufficient understanding for somebody to reckon with their need to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, to square up to their sin and their lost condition, and their only hope being in the, the Lord of glory, Jesus himself. The words that you share bring that kind of, of power and illumination into the realm of the Spirit. Don't forget that. Sometimes we're trying to use, and th you know, just the right words and just the right approach and, and think of some clever way of, of presenting and convincing somebody to be a Christian. Don't you want to be a Christian? Speak the truth. Amen? Preach the word. The word is it, the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. Tell them what the Bible has to say. Tell them they're lost. Tell them that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means you. That includes you. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That goes beyond the head and into the heart. 
There's no hope. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Simple truths, speak them directly and have a confidence in the power of the word. It's alive and powerful. Remember that. Don't think, don't, don't think in terms of watering it down or you know, just uh, trying to uh, package it in some way that it might be a little bit more palatable. No, no, no. Make it plain, clear, and direct. Be frank. We, you know, lightly joking, we're not trying to start a fight. You know, we're not trying to just poke somebody in the eye, tell them they're, they're wrong, I'm right. Okay, you're wrong, you don't know what you're talking about, you don't know anything about spiritual matters, you're dead, you're ignorant, and you're a fool. But if you'll give me five minutes, I'll tell you how much I know about spiritual matters, and you, can too, you too can be enlightened. Well, that's not quite the approach we take, is it? They are dead and blind and, and ignorant of, of spiritual truth. They, they, they don't under, uh, a lost person does not understand spiritual truth. Foolishness to them, the Bible says. Mm -hmm. But the gospel, the entrance of God's word can bring light, can't it? Yep, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. You share truth with somebody and they can get saved. They can. They can get saved. So don't think in terms of uh, <clears throat> repackaging it and just uh, trying to make it uh, uh, just a, 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 a friendly uh, God loves you, don't you love God and God knows you and cares about you and, you know, and, and God bless you. And that wasn't just because somebody sneezed. <laughs> and some people, you know, that's about the extent of their they're witnesses. Blessings. Blessings. God bless you. Have a blessed day. Makes a good bumper sticker. That's their witness. Be blessed. That's good. Be blessed. Be blessed. Just people that you check on. Be blessed. Hey, you know, maybe some of them are, maybe some are Christians. And, but, you know, when somebody says that, you, you probably ask them, what are they talking about? I do. I'll just say, yeah, you too. You have a blessed day too. The gospel, the gospel goes beyond just be blessed, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Speak the name of Jesus. Preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's powerful. That's powerful stuff. Because it's alive. It's spirit, isn't it? It's spirit. Uh, Hebrews 4.12, of course. Got to get it into your notes. The word of God is quick or living active and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So we're on this point, just to encourage and remind and instruct and, and uh, yes, uh, to uh, <clears throat> challenge everybody to remember that when you're preaching the gospel, it's, it's alive and it is very powerful, very, very powerful. Preach the word. The truth is powerful. It's alive. When it says quick and powerful, that's alive and powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the, the, the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. See, it gets down inside uh, a soul, doesn't it? People have got their reasonings and their thoughts. And you won't always have a good uh, answer to some of the questions that people will put to you. And you might know your Bibles well and heard a lot of the, the, the questions that people come on up with and the wonderings. And, and I don't know. Uh, I, you, know you don't know. Uh, uh, who knows why uh, bad things happen to good people? Who knows that one? Hmm? Well, uh, and I don't, I don't mean to just say that that's the, the mystery of the ages. I mean, we live in a sin-cursed world. Right? Right? That's, the, that's the, the, the general answer to that difficult question. But remember, you preach the gospel. Share the truth. And remember that people sometimes will try to take things uh, 
on, uh, off onto a tangent and change the subject a little bit, and you try to skillfully and tactfully bring the message back to their need for the saving life of, of Jesus Christ and, and square up to the truth of the gospel. Are they ready to make a commitment of their lives to Jesus? Do they acknowledge that they're, they're in sin? Do they have an assurance of their salvation? Do they know where they'll spend eternity when they've breathed their last here in this life? Share truth with them. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. The gospel, the word of God, pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Gets deep inside a soul, doesn't it? <clears throat> Go with me over to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. This is Stephen. He's, um, he's shortly to be martyred. But he's preaching his last sermon here. This is his last witness. Verse 8 says, Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. They couldn't resist the, the power that, that, that came from this man. The wisdom and under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, they couldn't resist, could they? No. Here he is preaching the gospel, sharing Jesus with these people, telling them of their need to repent, need to believe, place their trust in Jesus Christ, and they, they couldn't resist it. Why? I mean, these were learned people. These are people of the synagogues. They were educated, weren't they? But they couldn't resist because he spoke truth. They had arguments. They had their philosophies. They had their reasonings of their rabbis. And he was speaking truth, living, powerful truth. And that's what you speak when you open up your mouth and start telling people about what the Bible has to say regarding reality. I was, I was blessed to hear a report of, you know, the, the uh, young people and some of the adults are in a uh, nursing home there. Again, been out for a while there because of, you know, uh, 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 some, some more sickness that went through, but they got to get in there today. And, and Marion was just telling me of a conversation <clears throat> that she had guy that was talking about how he, uh, he really didn't believe anything because he had, he had heard just in his life, been exposed to so many different religions, um, didn't know what to believe, so he didn't believe anything. Well, that's a pretty foolish thing to do, just to throw it all out. And, uh, and, and, and Jim and Marianne and I were talking of how, yeah, the, the problem with that line of thinking is that that to, to all too many, a religion is subjective, isn't it? Well, this person believes that because that's what they choose to believe, and this one chooses that. And, and who am I to say that, that I'm right, they're wrong, and this one's better, and that one's better? And Marianne just was, you know, right on, said, no, nope, we're talking about truth and the reality of one true God. Yeah. Because Jesus is, uh, or God Almighty is the ultimate objective reality, isn't he? Yeah. He is real. And we've got, we've got philosophies, and we've got all kinds of religions, false religions, but there's one true God. And you know that. And that's what you preach. One true God who sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And there are, there are just countless numbers of, of religions and sects of those religions and even within those sects of those countless numbers of different religions, uh, the communicants are holding all their own personal beliefs, aren't they? Sure. And truth cuts right through all that. Doesn't it? And that's what you preach. You preach the gospel. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. 
Go with me over to 2 Peter chapter 1. We've got a couple more minutes. 2 Peter chapter 1. Don't be guilty of getting distracted and entangled with the affairs of this life. Remember that you've been called to be salt and light. These are the most weighty matters that human beings have to deal with. Matters of the soul, matters of the, of the eternal realm, matters that pertain to God Almighty, our maker. Amen? Matters that pertain to salvation, heaven and hell. We have no business getting distracted and entangled with the stuff of this life so that we forget to be the salt and light God has called us to be. Peter writes, and we read from verse 15, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. And then he says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. You know, we, we mentioned false religions. Those are cunningly devised fables. So whether it's, you know, it's, it's some of the ones that are, are uh, perversions and corruptions of Christianity, you know, like Roman Catholicism or Jehovah's Witnesses or Seventh-day Adventists or Mormons, those are all corruptions and perversions of biblical Christianity, aren't they? Yep. And they have followed cunningly devised fables. And then you can add to that, of course, all the others. You've got, you know, Islam, and you've got Hinduism, and you've got Buddhism, and lots and lots of religions. Cunningly devised fables. The Apostle Peter says, we've not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you. <clears throat> the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And then he goes on to testify of what he saw and heard, doesn't he? For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the, eternal, from the excellent glory. <clears throat> this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. He was just testifying. He saw Jesus glowing, didn't he? Moses and Elijah there talking with him. And then a voice from heaven. Peter, James, and John are up there with him. He heard it. We didn't make this stuff up. We're just testifying of what we have seen and what we have heard. This voice came from heaven. We heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. And then he says what? We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came in at an old time but the, by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, this is an interesting passage of Scripture because Peter was on the Holy Mount. And he says, listen, we didn't follow cunningly devised fables. We were there. We saw Jesus transfigured before our very eyes, and we saw Moses and Elijah, and we heard a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. We heard that. We testify of that. But you know what? We've got something more sure than that. We've got the written word. We've got the Scripture the more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well to take heed. Peter places a lot of stock in the, uh, the value of the word of God, doesn't he? He's got his personal testimony and he's, he knows what he saw and what he heard. But he says, more sure than what I saw or heard is what is written. What is written? It is written. Preach the word. Preach the word of God. Tell people what the Bible has to say. Tell them what the Bible has to say. 
We're always talking about the value and the importance of hiding God's word in our heart. Amen? To be able ministers of the gospel, you ought to know the gospel. You ought to be able to quote it. And if, and if you don't, if you don't know the, the, the scripture well, then, you know, get started on learning it more. And you know the, 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 the best way to really get good at something is by practicing, by doing it. Amen? Put that word of God uh, to use in your conversation. You will definitely develop a proficiency and, and skill in handling it, speaking it. The more you've hidden in your heart, the more there is there for the Holy Spirit to bring to your remembrance as you're, as you're talking with people. Amen? Good to know that God loves you. But how wonderful it is to know that it says in this place and in this place and this place that God loves you. And what his love is like. Amen? And to know that the Bible says. And uh, start with learning what it says. And then, yeah, from there, learn where it says it. Learn the addresses. Because there's also a value in being able to turn to those passages in the scripture. And let the people see it with their own eyes. Sometimes the witness takes on that form, doesn't it? But be able to capably, skillfully handle the word of God, knowing what it says. The Bible says... You must be born again, or you cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus said, you must be born again. That's Bible. Directly quoted, isn't it? Yep, it is. Word of God is powerful. Truth is powerful. It cuts to the heart. That's why they stoned Stephen, isn't it? That's why Paul was... Persecuted as he was persecuted. That's why uh, Jesus experienced the opposition. Because he spoke truth. Because he told them the truth. Therefore they hated him. Amen? Amen. Because truth is powerful. So don't water it down. Don't think that you can come up with some clever way of, of convincing somebody of their need for salvation by modifying and altering the scripture. Just speak it plain. Speak it plain. Without apology, without embarrassment. You're not ashamed of that, that gospel. Amen? It's the power of God unto salvation. And that's what we're preaching for, isn't it? Preaching to honor God and see some of these souls saved. So give them a good, a good dose of truth. That the eyes could be opened. Amen? Amen. We'll finish there for this evening. Heavenly Father, how we love you and praise you and thank you. We thank you, Lord God. We talk about the gospel message and, and, and we're reminded afresh of how wonderful it is to know truth that has set us free and continues to, to free us, how powerful truth is. It brings conviction, brings understanding to the simple Truth guides us each and every day. And we know that it is through the gospel, the word of truth, that we came to be born again. And Father, as we talk about sharing the gospel with others, people that don't know you, don't know Jesus, We need the anointing of your Holy Spirit. We need to be guided. None of us can say, oh, I can't. I'm just a child. Oh, I, I, I can't do that. I really don't know much, very, very much scripture. I'm new as a believer or I've not been walking with the Lord very long or I've not been taught much of the word of God. No, we're reminded that we can share with anybody the things that we've seen and heard. If we've been born again, we, we have a testimony. By your grace, we'll not be afraid of men's faces, we'll not <clears throat> give place to timidity will not be afraid of persecution, rejection. 
And we won't allow the devil to rob any peace from our hearts as we would read of others being persecuted for their love for you and their stand for the gospel. That's been the lot of Christians in every age. And if it comes to our door, those matters belong to you, Father. And your grace will be sufficient for your people. We thank you, O oh Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Help us to let the light shine brightly, O oh Lord, for your glory. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand together, beloved, and minister to the Lord in song. You are God and we praise thee. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We, your people, bless and praise your holy name, O oh Lord God. Hallelujah. Father, together we pray that, especially at this season, when we as Christians would celebrate the incarnation, the gift of your Son, help us to be all the more mindful of telling the souls that are around us that you bring across our paths, O oh Lord God, that we find when we go out into the, the highways and hedges, O oh Lord God, Help us to be very, very mindful and very ready to open up our mouths and to tell them about you and to tell them about your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, the way, the truth, and the life. Granted, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, be sure and greet one another in the love of the Lord. God's grace and peace go with you all.